I've listened to The Weight of These Wings by Miranda Lambert for years. And I listened to it once yesterday. Welcome to Spin It. Everybody and welcome back to Spin It, the record ranking podcast for people who would rather be listening to music. I'm James, and with me, Connor. That's me. That's you, and we are talking about music. And yeah, say and today's uh, I, don't, I don't know. I was trying to find the way to be like, and that's Miranda Lambert. But how wild would it have been if I was like, and that's Miranda Lambert, and then she jumped into the Discord call? That'd be pretty cool. That would make me very nervous about the episode we're about to record. <laughs> I, I don't know. This is a lot of pressure all of a sudden. Well, don't worry. She's not here. Okay, good. You better not be pulling my leg. Yet. Yet. <laughs> yeah, she got stuck in traffic on her way to the podcast this week. <laughs> it's, it was her wings. They're too heavy, so she'll be here in a minute. Mm. In all seriousness, though, how heavy do you think wings are? I mean, you're the guy that studied pigeon racing a ton. What do you think the weight of wings like really is? Depends on the wings. No, you're right. Okay. I mean, an ostrich wing is different than a pigeon wing. And and like plain wings are probably heavier than both of those. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I guess it just depends what kind of wings Miranda Lambert has. But also, aren't they like super light? Like, don't birds have like really light bones or whatever to make it so they can fly? Yeah, well, that's not the case for Miranda. She's got heavy wings and full bones, so. Because she's not a bird. No, she's not. Very astute commentary <laughs> from your favorite record ranking podcast. Anyway. Uh, we're, yeah, we're doing a little more country. You were right when you said, I mean, in our Eric Church episode, that we kind of had neglected country slightly, modern country, for a while. So I kind of thought we'd give it a little little second dose in short order. And that's why we're back here. Nice. Nice indeed. And obviously, once again, as a guy that knows a little country music, especially from around this era, impossible that you don't know Miranda Lambert, right? Who is she? Is she a bird? Sounds like a bird. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, she's got heavy bones, heavy wings. When we get our pigeon to race, we should name it Miranda Lambert. We're not going to get a pigeon to race. Yeah, but hypothetically, if I was to someday come onto this podcast and say, I have a pigeon to race, what should I name it? Your answer better be Miranda Lambert. Miranda Lambert sounds like a bird, as we just determined. We didn't really determine it, you just said it. That's how a lot of things are determined on this podcast, I just say them. That's true. So what, then, if you are familiar with her, as I know you are, what's your favorite Miranda Lambert song? Ooh, I didn't come prepared with this answer. I feel like it's not a thing you need to prepare for. Like, you should know it. It should be your favorite. You know me. I don't like to pick favorites. Top three. The House That Built Me was a good one. Yeah, it is. I don't remember if I liked White Liar or not. Then it probably wasn't in your top three. Well, I just I remember the title. Yeah, I did like White Liar. Never mind. White Liar, yeah. I, it took me, I had to listen to the song to remember which one it was. Mm. Probably another one from that Revolution album. I think that's my favorite Miranda Lambert album. A little sad we're not doing it. It is a little sad. I'll be honest, 2015 is about the time I fell off of modern country music. I've made my third selection. Okay, what's your what's your third choice? I'm going with Over You. Oh, I don't even know if I know that one. Yes, you know Over You. It was another one I didn't recognize until I heard the song and went, oh yeah. I remember loving this song. Well, let me, let me see here. I do remember that. You're right. See? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I think those are my three. Okay, good choice. I think I'm going to put in a vote for Gunpowder and Lead as my favorite. It's a classic. Oh, yeah, this one. Yeah. Ooh, this one. That is a good one. Yeah, it is. Well, let's talk about Miranda Lambert. I mean, her history and her career. Now that we've talked about some of our favorites. Let's do it. Before she gets here. Before she gets here, we'll give you the background. <laughs> Miranda Lambert was born in Texas in 1983. And when she was young, her parents volunteered their house as a shelter for victims of domestic violence, which had a big impact on her outlook and her music. She said she tried to work a lot of that experience into her songwriting, especially in songs like Gunpowder and Lead. She started singing while she was still back in high school, and she became the lead singer of the house band at a little joint called the Rio Palm Isle, which, way back in the day, hosted artists like Elvis, Willie Nelson, and it's the place that's credited with launching the career of country duo Brooks and Dunn. When she was just 16, before she finished high school, she had the opportunity to go to Nashville to record, but she wasn't really writing songs at that point, so the people that brought her here, they just gave her songs to record, to sing. She wasn't really a fan of the stuff that they gave her, so she walked out, 
and decided to learn to play the guitar and write her own songs. Within a year or so, she had a collection of 10 songs that she was pretty happy with. She recorded them and put them out as a self-made, self-titled album. And she kept touring all around Texas. In 2003, she appeared on the singing competition show, Nashville Star, just like Casey Musgraves, who we talked about on episode 2. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and like Casey, she also didn't win. She placed third, but she really impressed the producers, and particularly one of the judges, Tracy Gershon, who happened to be an executive with Sony Music. So she signed on with Sony's Epic Records that same year, and her first major label album, Kerosene, was a smash hit. Debuted at number one on the country charts and went platinum, and obviously she's pretty much considered to be the biggest, most successful contestant in Nashville Star's history. So that's an achievement. It also helped springboard her into a touring career. She was an opener for Keith Urban, George Strait, Dirks Bentley, and Toby Keith before she was able to support tours on her own. Nowadays, she could sell out arenas. You know, she's fine as a headliner. It's impressive for a bird. <laughs> I guess. The last singing bird we talked about. Hate Beak? Yeah, Hate Beak. <laughs> Don't put Miranda Lambert in the same category as Bird Screamo. She put herself there. No, she didn't. <laughs> the album has wings in the title. It's not about birds. Let's other things have wings. If anything, you put her there. How? By making the joke about how heavy her wings were. That's not my joke. It's the name of the album. Mm, I don't know. Bird jokes aside. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Her second record, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, was similarly successful. Yeah. And that's the one that's got hits like Gunpowder and Lead, Famous in a Small Town, Me and Charlie Talking. Once she had those under her belt, she started gaining a lot of recognition from the Academy of Country Music and the Country Music Association as a really significant up-and-comer in the genre. And her next three albums, Revolution for the Record, F-O-U-R, The Record, pretty great, and Platinum, came up with even bigger hits like White Liar, like The House That Built Me, Baggage Claim, Mama's Broken Heart, Little Red Wagon and more. Probably my favorite. Probably what your favorite stretch of albums is that one? Yeah. I think so. That's just, that's fair. She also took on a new musical project in the midst of all those solo releases. She helped put together this powerhouse country girl group, the Pistol Annies, featuring herself, Angelina Presley, and Ashley Monroe. And they've been pretty active. They've put out a new album every handful of years since 2011. And that takes us up to The Weight of These Wings, Miranda Lambert's sixth studio album. If you haven't heard it, you want to know what we're about to say? Go listen to it, and then you'll know. Well, you got some time. We don't get to that part till later in the show. Well, yeah, but you don't have enough time to listen to this (laughs) album. It's a long one. Yeah, which brings me to my next point. I got nothing but grief last week. I, yeah, not nothing but grief. For my 26 songs that I brought and how long it took you to listen and how it was such a chore to get through and you were exhausted by the end and then turn right around and make me... Listen to 24 tracks? Well, you're not going to listen. Don't get all upset on the Year of Healing, okay? This is a bad way to kick off. The Year of Healing hasn't started yet. Oh. Well, then consider this my vengeance in exchange for Ray Stevens. I'm just saying. No, no, no. We, we were supposed to have squashed the bug. This sounds like you're trying to restart up the war after the treaty has been signed. No, no. The bug squashed. I don't know. I have to get one last jab in before the end of the year now. Well, you know. Context. This is a, this is an album. The Ray Stevens. That was a collection of songs. Oh, oh, and so because of that, it's lesser than... No, no, I just mean... The format's different. Hear that, Ray Stevens? No, the format's different. You're on thin ice, buddy. And the other thing about it is, you mentioned this last week, too, is that, I mean, I had to listen to Ray Stevens just once, closely, and take all my notes on it as I was doing it. And that does indeed take a greater degree of focus and energy than listening to an album or reviewing an album that I've listened to for years that I know really well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying now you know what I go through every single week. Yeah, I do. I think that'd make you more compassionate. You know what? Yeah, maybe that level of empathy will only strengthen our bond. Doesn't seem like it. Turned right around and put me in the same position you were in. We're just walking a few too many miles in each other's shoes lately. It's empathetic minus the imp. That's that's athetic. Just pathetic. No, no, that's athetic what you just said. Uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Well, it's that too. It's pretty aesthetic what you just did. Myrna Lambert's not going to like that when she gets here. You're right. <laughs> well, let's talk about the weight of these wings. It came out two years after Platinum in November of 2016. And it came out in this period of, you know, personal turmoil 
for Miranda Lambert. She was kind of trying to stay out of the spotlight for a while at that time because she was going through a divorce with fellow country star Blake Shelton at the time. Yeah. Yeah. They had been together since 2007, married since 2011, split in 2015. So the album, thematically, is pretty strongly drawn from those experiences and her feelings during that period. It's very personal and introspective. It's her first proper double album, by the way, consisting of two 12-track halves. The first dozen is collectively called The Nerve, and the second set is known as The Heart. And of those 24 tracks, she wrote or co-wrote 20 tracks. And actually, one thing I think is pretty notable is that We Should Be Friends, one of the album's singles and biggest hits, was a solo write for her. No co-writers at all. Good job. Bravo. Tell her that yourself when she gets here. I think The Weight of These Wings probably made more of a splash than any of her previous albums. I feel like I heard it talked about a lot more. Some of the singles got a lot of... I don't know if I'd agree with that. Really? I'm a fan of her earlier work, as I think I've already said. Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't mean it made as big of a splash. Oh, I feel, I feel like 2009 to 2011 was, like, huge for Miranda Lambert. It was, in its own way. But it was a pretty big album in its own right. It earned the ACM Album of the Year Award, which was actually Miranda Lambert's record-maintaining fifth straight album to do, and is widely considered one of the best albums of the year, not just within the realm of country music, but across all genres. Four years later, in 2020, Rolling Stone placed it at number 480 on their list of the greatest albums of all time, which, to be honest, may be a little bit of recency bias, if you ask me, but I think the point still stands that it's a solid record and is cross-genres recognized as such. And, a uh, fun little bit of trivia, the Highway Vagabond tour that she did for this record kind of had to be canceled and rescheduled. She had a lot of vocal trouble she needed to get worked on and heal up from. But when she did finally get around to touring the album, it was her first ever solo headlining shows in Europe. Oh, cool. Yeah, going international. Since The Weight of These Wings came out, she's put out two more albums and is still going strong. So if you're keeping track, in total, that's nine solo records and four albums with with the Pistol Annies. And she's had a pretty successful career, obviously. Like you said, her early years were big years for her. This album was turning heads. So she's earned 78 major awards on 192 nominations, including more Academy of Country Music Awards than anyone in history, with 31 wins. She's got eight consecutive nominations for Favorite Female Artist in the Country category at the American Music Awards. She's got eight CMT Awards, 14 CMA Awards, and three Grammys on 27 nominations, although she did go home 0 for 4 this past year in 2023. Oof. Yeah. In 2018, she earned her ninth straight ACM Female Vocalist of the Year award and passed the previous record holder, Reba McIntyre. And this next award is a spin at first. Miranda Lambert became a cowgirl honoree in the National Cowgirl Museum and Hall of Fame. That's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. The National Cowgirl Hall of Fame. I didn't know that was a thing. So I did a little research on it. Side Sidebar here about the Cowgirl Hall of Fame. It's in Fort Worth, Texas. And as they proclaim, they're the only museum in the world dedicated to honoring the women of the West. There are currently 248 honorees. Everyone from Sacagawea to Laura Ingalls Wilder to Georgia O'Keeffe to Annie Oakley to Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. All of them honorary cowgirls. Who knew? Awesome. Wild, right? I want to be an honorary cowgirl. How can we get you in there? I don't think we can. <laughs> I think that's beyond the scope of what's possible for us. For starters, you're not a woman of the West. It could be. Well, good luck to you. So we should just do the... Should just do the spin a cow. Honorary cow. No way. Not a chance we honor anyone as the spin it cow. Well, hang on. Uh, who said this is for people? Oh, it's for a cow? Yeah, I just want to start inducting cows into the spin it cow of fame. How, why wouldn't it be Hall of Cow? Why, why cow of fame? Oh, it should. I, I don't know. I like Hall of Cow better because it sounds like holy cow. Into the spin it. Holy cow. I don't. You're not making any sense. <laughs> Why would we- I'm just saying, there's some pretty nice cows out there. Yeah, but why would we do that? Uh, just because I can't be an honorary cow girl. Okay. In spite. <laughs> out of spite, huh? Well, I'd like to make our first nominees the ones featured in Randy Travis's Click Clack Moo. 
Oh, that's a good cow. All right. The first cow in the Hall of Cow. Yep. Anyway, other real trivia tidbits about Miranda Lambert. <laughs> you and I only walked past it. We didn't go in, but she's got her own personal honky tonk on Lower Broadway in downtown Nashville called Casa Rosa and is themed after her Texas roots and obviously her successful music career. It's mega popular with tourists. There's always a pretty big line outside. And when it opened in 2021, she was actually the first modern female country artist to have a honky tonk on Lower Broadway. And she also does a lot of work for rescue dogs. In 2009, she founded the Mutt Nation Foundation and has done adoption drives, fundraisers, uh, raised awareness, and just helped provide support for animals across the country. Good job. That's right. So that's the way to these wings in the nutshell. That's Miranda Lambert's career. So you got the background for when she shows up. And now for the segment where we either tell you some more interesting true things or lie straight to your face. Well, not straight to your face. There are, there are a couple steps in between. But yeah. Around the corner from your face. Yeah. Let's hit it. It's everybody's favorite game show. Fact or spin. Fact or spin. Yeah. And the, the host of everybody's favorite game show, everybody's favorite dastard, the mixtaper. Woo! Hey, it's me, the mixtaper. Hello, welcome back. I uh I'm kind of surprised to see you back, to be honest. Yeah. Listen, I uh might have said some things that were a bit rash last week. That uh premature yeah i understand you were my lawyers tell me that i'm contractually obligated to be here oh i didn't want to bring it up in the moment you and connor were kind of having a, a whole thing there yes yeah, so you'd suffered a brutal defeat at the hands of the host team last week not to remind you because it's still very fresh i'm sure in your mind but you were the victim of the very first double shutout in factor spin history yeah I, I hate playing against connor he's just so good at the game and talented and funny and smart well that goes for the whole host team well what? let's not you've never double shut out me no i haven't i think connor is just the superior factor spin player to you probably against me against you well that's hurtful but yeah. statistics don't lie i mean yeah. his sample size is smaller than mine but it's true he's hardly missed much to my delight but i'm hoping that this week will go my way now that i'm playing you again okay well let's hear the way to these spins the only reason i'm still here is those student loans oh yeah that's true you gotta pay those off yeah i can't really afford to not be here on top of that, I have a deal with Starbucks that, you know, they fire me if I stop doing this podcast and promoting for them. That's a weird deal. I'm really uh locked in here. Okay, well, I hope you brought your A-game. Just I, I hope the thrill of retirement didn't throw you off. It's pretty great, but if anything, it's only made me stronger. Okay, prove it. All right, I will. With my first supposedly true fact, she keeps a box cutter on stage. Ooh, Starting strong. Is it for cutting boxes? No. Is it for cutting anything? I mean, for stabbing something. For stabbing something? Uses it more as a shiv. What? Against whom? What does she stab? Your, your first thing thinking might be she, it's there to shiv anybody who might try to get up on stage, you know, and... It's not. Be aggressive, you know, might be like a defense thing, but no. It's more, uh, because she hates the beach. Hates the beach. Yeah. This feels like a roundabout. I don't know what that means. So if I hate the beach, are you popping beach balls? You nailed it! <laughs> okay, because I figure at concerts, people bring beach balls around and stuff and throw them around. Yeah, it drives her insane. Really? She doesn't like when people do that? She says nothing makes her more crazy than when she's up on stage singing a ballad and a beach ball comes flying at her head. So she keeps a box cutter on the stage with her for such occasions. A beach ball will come at her head, she'll catch it, walk over to where she's keeping the box cutter, and slash it. Yeah. How often does this happen, that you need to keep a box cutter on the stage? Enough. Enough. <laughs> but, like, can't you just throw it off behind, like, backstage? I don't think that makes as big a point. True, it doesn't. Sending a message. Interesting. She hates the beach. <laughs> I almost made that the fact. <laughs> the title was Miranda Lambert Hates the Beach. Well, I'm glad you didn't. I think I'm gonna say this is a spin. Why is that? I think she hates beach balls. I do. I can understand it. <laughs> Who doesn't, right? Yeah, well, you don't. <laughs> but I think having a box cutter on stage at all times feels a little too far. Mm. That feels like edge. Like, surely one of the people in the crew could just have it. I don't know. I don't know if you'd need it on the stage. Things happen. Props are there. Set pieces move. A box cutter not only would maybe be a liability, but also could just get lost in the shuffle of things. Mm. So I'm going to say this one's a spin. Also, I kind of feel like it might be true. So I'm going against my gut. Fair enough. Well, for once, your gut was right. This is a true fact. Wow. Oh, no. That's interesting. I wouldn't have guessed. 
Well, you didn't guess. You literally just went through that process. Oh, uh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, she keeps it on her drum riser. Interesting. I'll have to look for it the next time I see her in concert and then throw a beach ball and see what happens. No, I'm kidding. Don't. I'm not going to do that. Don't do it. Don't do it. This is. We're not endorsing it. But if you see it happen, tell us. We want to know. I, admittedly, though, a box cutter is better than gunpowder and lead. <laughs> That's true. Imagine, though, just sharpshooting beach balls out of the crowd. Pow, pow. That'd be a pretty cool way to hate the beach. Sure would. That's honorary cowgirl. My next supposedly true fact. She was part of a presidential mix-up. I don't know if mix-up's really the right word, but that's what I'm going with. Well, you're the mixed taper, so mix-ups seem to be in your wheelhouse. A presidential mix-up? Yeah, not like mix-up like presidents were like confused for one another, but like no. mix-up like mix-up with the wrong crowd sort of thing. What? <laughs> I don't know what that means. You know, mix-ups like a like a, a, a you know. I don't know. Isn't like isn't a, mix up like like a like a fight? A fight? No, it's a, it's a fight's a bad word. <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting worse. Like an altercation. <laughs> you're saying she got into an altercation with a president? Uh, I'm not saying she, she did. I just said she was involved in one. We've had presidents on the podcast before, and I always just I mean, yeah. I mean we need to clarify presidents of the United States. Yeah. Okay. Usually it's not. <laughs> this time it is. <laughs> so what what president is also involved in this mix up, this fight or altercation, this scrap, this this situation? <laughs> I, we have many synonyms, and I really can't tell you what this is yet. <laughs> it was President Clinton. President Bill Clinton getting mixed up. That means mix up can mean a whole lot of other things too. <laughs> What's the situation? What's happening? What's Bill Clinton doing? Is he president at the time? No. You sound really unsure. Yes. Yes, he was president. What? No. Okay. No, he wasn't president. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 I had to I'd check a date. He was president. Oh, okay. <laughs> and what's happening? What's he doing? Being sued for sexual harassment. Ah. Yeah. Like the Bill Clinton thing. Yeah. Paula Jones, former Arkansas State employee. Who? What? Paula Jones. Oh, so not Monica Lewinsky. No. And what's Miranda Lambert got to do with this? <laughs> uh, less her and more her parents. Okay. What are her parents doing in this? They're private investigators. They're PIs? <laughs> <laughs> yep, both of them. What are they investigating? Him or, or her? or? Yeah, they were part of the lawsuit. Miranda Lambert's parents were private eyes that investigated Bill Clinton. What? Yeah, they worked very closely with Paula Jones and her legal team. How'd they get connected? What's, what's the tie together there? How'd they know each other? I don't know. I don't know, just assume because they're PIs and they got involved in the work and... Okay. Hmm. I don't know what to do about this. <laughs> Is there anything else I need to know? Is there anything else you want to know? Yeah, I guess I'm just curious how much she was aware of what was going on at the time. She would have been like a teenager. Yeah, I think she was pretty aware. Okay, we'll have to ask her. When she gets here. <laughs> yeah. Walks in the door. Were you aware? <laughs> what did you know about Bill Clinton? Probably too much. We all we all know a little too much about Bill Clinton, if I'm honest. <laughs> but is this true? Well, that depends on what your definition of is is. <laughs> <laughs> I think this one's a spin. Any reason why on this one? Any justification? Well, part of me thinks that this is so such a specific situation and event. There's no way that you could have made this up. Mm. And that just kind of feels like why it has to be a spin, I guess. Fair enough. It also isn't particularly about Miranda Lambert. It could have been about anybody's parents. Mm. And also, they're Texas. You know, this happened in Arkansas. Seems like maybe they wouldn't be too involved. This is... A true fact. No way. <laughs> really? Part of a presidential fight? Mix up. Mix up. Altercation. Altercation. Lawsuit. Lawsuit's <laughs> probably the most accurate word. But she wasn't really a part of a presidential lawsuit, was she? So she was in the sense that her parents brought their work home with them quite a lot. In the sense that they did a lot of PI work with like uh, women who were being abused by their husbands. And they would bring the women home to hide them and shelter them until legal action could be taken. Yeah. And so she grew up with a lot of abused strangers in her house as yeah. a child. Yeah, and I knew that. I just, I guess I didn't think that would translate into PI and presidential. Yeah, they were PIs. Wow. Presidential investigators. <laughs> anyway, number three. She was involved. In a hit and run. Oh, she was involved in a mix up. <laughs> so, what's a hit and run? Is she a driver or is she the uh, the victim here? Uh, in this scenario, she was the victim. She got hit. 
Yeah, and it was really less of a hit and run and more of just a hit and get caught. So just a hit. A hit and fess up. She just got hit. <laughs> it's not a hit and run at all. The and run is like a critical component of the hit and run dynamic. <laughs> yeah, but I need to call it a hit and run for the parallelism. Whatever. You'll understand in a moment. Where is she going when this happens? Well, you see, I, uh, I used a similar supposedly true fact on Connor all the way back in episode 20. Because what I'm telling you is this happened while she was on the set of The Voice. No, no, not another voice hit and run. <laughs> so Miley Cyrus's hit and run on The Voice was her backing into the sound trailer. Hence why I said in this scenario, she was the victim. Because in the other one, Miley Cyrus was at fault. Okay, yeah, it's true. But so Miley Cyrus backed into the sound trailer and then got caught on a hot mic. What happened to Miranda Lambert? In this story, her airstream was hit. Oh, she's the she's the trailer that got hit then. Who did it? Was it Miley Cyrus? <laughs> No, it was security. Oh. Hence why it was more of a hit and fess up. Because, I mean, who were you, who else would you have called about a hit and run other than security? True. Yeah, what's the situation? They just back up recklessly? On set, they use the little, like, golf carts to get around. Uh-huh. And, and yeah, they kind of backed into Miranda Lambert's Airstream while she was on the set of The Voice. Surprising. Didn't really cause any real damage, though. No. Okay, that's good. Just a golf cart, not going very fast. But she was in it at the time, so, you know, she heard it. It was like, what the heck? Did it shake? I mean, <laughs> that's that's a little intense. I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay. I think I'm going to say this one is a spin. Oh, wow. I'm not even going to ask any other information. It's going right in for spin. Okay, well, what else should I know? Nothing you should know. Just if there's anything else you want to know, you usually ask more questions. But if you're happy, lock in spin. No, I'm pretty happy with it. My thoughts process behind this is that you, you already used this fact in episode. 20. Sure. I think it's been a long time. I think she's got ties to the voice that you obviously are aware of, and so it feels like an easy grab to go back to the voice spin mm. from, oh... <laughs> 72 episodes back? I don't know. I'm just skeptical. I'm skeptical because the situation is so similar to Miley Cyrus's. Uh-huh. Great. So you're locking in spin. Yeah, I am. All right. This is a true spin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's not true. No, it's not. Any truth to this? She was on The Voice, and she owns an Airstream. Well, okay. Two key components of this fact that would need to be true. Security does exist. The Voice does have security. I think it was pretty much all true, except for them backing in and hitting her. Okay. I was kind of, I was kind of banking on you being like, ah, oh, but he, no, like, I was going for the reverse, reverse psychology, where you'd be like, this is so similar that it has to be false, but that's why it's true sort of oh, okay. logic like he did on the first one yeah okay i get that but i have two left so i'd like to know and i'm gonna play a game with you one of my remaining ones is true and one of my remaining ones is false i'd like you to pick a number one or two i'll play your little games to pick your number but you got to tell me whether the one i leave behind is the is true or false okay what <laughs> afterwards sure no no i mean now no 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take lucky number two. Lucky number two. Will it be true or will it be false? That's up to you. That rhymed. Yeah, it did. She collects salt and pepper shakers. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, that's tough. Like unique ones, novelty ones, interesting ones. Does she go places and get them as souvenirs? What kind of salt and pepper shakers are we talking about? Or just like disposable ones? Vintage ones. Vintage? How vintage? I don't know. Vintage enough. How big is her collection? 50. 50 salt and 50 pepper or 25 of each? Usually they come together, right? Salt and pepper shakers. Like, Usually. So I think it's 50 sets. And it's probably grown since, since this interview. Okay. Why? Does she do this? Does she like them? I don't know. Is this a Marge Simpson, like, I just think they're neat kind of thing? She just has a love for all things vintage. All things vintage is one thing, but you really narrowed your scope down with salt and pepper shakers. Listen, salt and pepper shakers are all things vintage. That's it? Nothing <laughs> else can be vintage. How much does she spend? Like, so let's say she's out and about, sees the coolest salt and pepper shaker ever. She's Miranda Lambert. She probably can spend any ridiculous amount she wants on a salt and pepper shaker. It won't be ridiculous to her. Like, if I went to the store and saw a $50 salt and pepper shaker, I'd be like, that's a bit absurd. True. She'd walk in and be like, that's a steal. <laughs> I don't know about that. She's Miranda Lambert. <laughs> true, true. Does she use them or are they just like for display? What kind of salt and pepper shakers does she use? She doesn't use any because she displays them all. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she hates salt and pepper and that's why this is ironic. That'd be funny. No, I, I don't know. Okay. This is a hard one to believe. Yeah. Would you like to know her favorite one? Yeah, I would. I'm surprised I didn't think to ask that. I was curious about it. Her favorite set is uh, one of a 55 Chevy with an Airstream. Ooh, 
that's pretty cool in interesting that's a weird shape for a salt and pepper shaker yeah you know because her 55 chevy she's had since she was like 17 and she's a big fan of her airstream made for her by a fan a fan made it well, a fan gave it to her. I guess I assume a fan made it. I doubt there's a 55 Chevy with an Airstream salt and pepper shaker just on the shelf at Walmart you can pick up. No, it's at the collector stores. It's That's an antique. Very specific items to put together on a salt and pepper shaker. But either way, it was given to her by a fan. So I guess to your earlier question of how much would she spend, she spent zero on that one. <laughs> it's her favorite. Ugh tough that's tough this feels like a spin to me this has all the markings of a spin so you're going with fact no i'm sticking with spin sticking with spin yeah yeah i think you probably saw some cool salt and pepper shakers maybe you saw the salt and pepper shakers that were the chevy and the airstream and decided that would be fun and so you worked it into a previous spin Mm, i have been known to do that i don't know if she really even does own an airstream (laughs) you could just lie about everything I am going to call this one a spin and say we left the fact behind. Mm, You would be wrong. This is a true fact. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, that's awful. I'm back on top. I have returned to the mountaintop. Well, after your double shutout. I look down upon you. That's my first loss uh, on the host team since my streak started. It's true. And now I'm one episode away from my streak starting again. It's true. You are. We'll see how that goes. But yeah, it's all true. And she does. She has an Airstream. She's like known for her luxury Airstream. She has like a really fancy one. Well, now now she's known for it by me. (laughs) The spin you left behind was she is a bird. (laughs) No way. (laughs) What are you going to try and say about that? I I Googled if there was any birds called Miranda Lambert and I found one. (laughs) That doesn't make any sense. Listen, it was it was a gamble and you chose poorly. Yeah, the bird one would have been pretty easy (laughs) in hindsight. I really did make the wrong choice here. Interesting fact, though. Yeah. It makes me want to look into salt and pepper shakers. We've had some weird collectors on the show, so I, you just never can tell. Mm-hmm. Really mixing it up with what she's collecting. Yeah. <laughs> she got into a mix-up <laughs> with some salt and pepper shakers. That's for sure. Do you ever actually mixed up sugar and salt? No, I don't think I have. I've never done that, but what I have done is put whipped cream on a bagel instead of cream cheese. Oh. That sucks. That sounds delicious. What? No, 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 no. It sucks. It is not delicious. It sounds awesome. It is not delicious. As the mixtape, I'm going to try that. Okay, so here's what happened. I was campus dining. I got my bagel. And next to the place where they had the bagels, <laughs> they had a big bowl of, like, whipped stuff. I was like, oh, cool. Cream cheese with the bagel. It's easy. Cream Makes cheese. Sense. There wasn't cream cheese anywhere else. There's a noticeable, like, consistency difference between the two. No, no, no. So I thought, well, you can, like, whip cream cheese. And so I was like, oh, that's nice. That's great. Or at least, at the very least, whipped butter, right? So I was like, okay, cool. But it was by this, it was for, there were cookies and bagels. It's like a bagel place. Like that's what they made in this corner of the dining hall. Interesting. So I covered them. I went and checked out, sat down. It was like (laughs) awesome. Breakfast time. It was like a big bite of a whipped creamy bagel and I almost threw up. (laughs) Awful. Sounds awesome. Because it wasn't refrigerated. It was just out here in a bowl. No, it was so bad. Don't do it. Oh, well, unrefrigerated sounds not as good. But refrigerated, game changer. I don't know. I guess I'm imagining buying some Cool Whip or something. Cool Whip's different. <laughs> cool Whip's not whipped cream. Yeah. Cool Whip is sweet. Yeah, you're you're right. That's what, well, I guess that's what I was imagining was Cool Whip. Because nope, otherwise, I don't know how on earth you confuse the two. Because actual whipped cream is like noticeably different from cream cheese. I don't know how you made that mistake. I was really, it was early. I was in a hurry. <laughs> And it was logical for that to have been cream cheese. Oh, I love that story. That's my new favorite story about you. Thanks. Well, Mixed Taper, we'll see you next week. We'll see if you can actually get that streak going. All I gotta do is not lose. Yeah, that's the sad truth. <laughs> and with that, I'll see you next week for another exciting round of Fact or Spin. Yep. Yeah. I'll be honest. I'm glad he's not retired. I was worried you forced him out last week. So. Yeah, I know. I'm glad. I was glad to see him back. It's nice to see that our lawyers got him trapped in an ironclad contract. <laughs> do you have an update on uh, Miranda's ETA? I haven't heard anything yet. Uh... You know, I think I'll send the mixtape out in the blimp to try to find her. In the blimp? <laughs> yeah. So he can catch up to her? Well, he's got to fly low because remember, she's got heavy wings, so. Oh, yeah. She's probably not flying very high. Well, good thing blimps are able to get low to the ground. Well, that's true. I mean, everything that flies can get low to the ground at least once. <laughs> Fair enough. Let's talk about the album cover. It's really not like there's a lot to say. It's Miranda Lambert with heavy wings. Yeah. 
in like black and white, right? Yeah, and there's a nice little frame around it. You know, it puts it right in the middle. Upon closer inspection, I think this like a you know a heart with wings on it behind her. I think that's like a gate to this little pasture slash enclosure she's standing in front of. Yeah, I agree. It's cool. You know, I do like though the acoustic guitar in the case that she's carrying with her, and that kind of just fits. It just kind of feels like the album, you know, as a guitar player like she is and singing all these guitar heavy songs. Yeah, you're you're just a big sucker for the guitar. Of course, you were gonna like it. No, it's not even that. I just think uh, it's a little bit that audience. No, when we get into the songs, we'll talk about. I mean, the there's smidge. just a pin. A dash, if you will. So many themes of this album are about this transience, this constantly being on the go and on the move, and it seems like the only things that she's got with her as she's on the road and trying to figure herself out are, you know, herself and her guitar to write these songs. So I think it's a good inclusion on the album cover, and I'm not biased much. So, here's the deal. So. This is a big double album, 24 tracks, and I think, I mean, we just did a B-side for Ray Stevens, so... For the first time ever, I don't think we're going to be able to talk about all these in full. So we're just going to focus on the highlights here. We'll we'll touch on the others just in terms of how they fit into the album. And audience, okay, he's saving you the trouble here, right, by doing this. But he still insisted I listen to the whole thing. So all of his talk about how long last week's listen period was and how taxing and tiring it was, that all still applies to me because he made me listen to all of them still. Well, it's true. Just to be clear. <laughs> I want to make sure that's clear. Yeah, well, but you'll notice that this album is lacking songs that resemble Shriner's Convention, and I don't think she babbles even once. Some would say for the worse. For, some <laughs> would say that, you think? I think some would. <laughs> hey, some, if you're out there. Would you? <laughs> let us know. Well, the first song we're going to talk about is the first song on the album, because that's obviously the opening statement, and it's an important one to touch on, Runnin' Just In Case. There's trouble where I'm going. I'm honestly bet there's trouble where you are because something tells me you bring a little bit of it with you. Call me a troublemaker? Or I guess you're calling me a trouble bringer. Yeah, you don't make it. It's just there with you. You weren't accusing me of making it. You just said I brought it with me. Yeah, don't put words in my mouth or else there's going to be trouble. <laughs> I like this very soft um, kind of crescendo opening to this song. It's a good way to kick out the album. It really is. Yeah, it's a slow kind of gentle song that builds into this, I, I don't know, almost anthemic sweeping song song about being on the road this you know she's making her way all across the south trying to go on this journey of self-discovery like we said the album art kind of implies find out who she is and we get these really great flashes of imagery you know i turn it up because that's sure how i feel turned up you know my mind is racing through the pines my hands are shaking on the steering wheel i definitely think it's the drums that make this feel anthemic as you said absolutely it's almost entirely the drums that give it that feel because they're, they're anthemic drums yeah it gets a little louder and a little more intense but i think the real thing that changes to make it crescendo is the drums i think the other thing about this song that i really like is that the music and the lyrics mesh together so well it's an easy to follow cadence a melody that's really inviting and hopeful for the future at the same time you really don't know where you're going i just think it's a nicely paired song it was all right. All right. Okay, fair. I think there's some good lines buried in here, though. One of my favorites is, I'm going north on 59, but I know good and well I'm headed south. Like, physically, I'm going northward, but mentally, emotionally, I'm in a downward spiral. That was all right. I think it's clever. And the whole hook of the song is that it's not love that she's chasing, but just in case it is, she's still going to run after it. So we never really get a sense of what it is, but we do know what it's not. But what she hopes it is, deep down. Deep, deep down. I think it's a solid album opener, and I think it only gets stronger with the progression into Highway Vagabond, which is kind of a song about the same thing. Like, Run It Just In Case feels like a setting out song. Highway Vagabond is like, okay, we've been on the road for a while, living the drifter life as a traveling musician out there on the road, and, and Highway Vagabond really digs more into that lifestyle. It's a lot more upbeat and plucky, kind of an upside to the first song's downside, I think, to kind of show us all sides of this situation. I didn't want to like this song. You didn't want to? Why not? Oh, uh, the chorus annoyed me. Really? It got stuck in my head in, like, the annoying way. Oh, okay. Yeah, in earworm kind of way. No, no, no. An earworm is like that, ooh, we got in there. You know, this is like this is like finding an earworm in your head apple. I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> what is that like? Nothing is worse than finding a, a worm in your apple. Okay. Now imagine finding an earworm in your head apple. What do you think that... 
Right. My ears were worming, but they weren't smiling. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Well, but you said you didn't want to like this song. Did you succeed in not liking this song? Because, I mean, you didn't say you didn't like it. We'll find out. When? Well, at the end or, or now? At the end. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love that opener, though. I want to go somewhere nobody knows and know somewhere that nobody goes. Nice little kind of reverse parallelism. It seems so simple, but I like it. It does that thing that a lot of modern... Because, again, for a lot of middle school and early high school, this kind of country music was, like, all that I listened to. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of songs I really liked, some songs I didn't care for as much. But a, a lot of it I liked. But I feel like I kind of fell out of love with modern country music around late high school, beginning of college. And that's about the time this came out. 2016? Yeah. Why? What drove you away? The style was getting bored. All the songs were about the same, like, four themes. And the song structures were all very similar. And, and I don't know, it just, it got very white noisy to me, I guess. And this commits one of those sins, you know, that I don't like in a lot of songs. Very, very short or fast verses with just this repeated chorus. It feels like every 20 seconds she's saying the words Highway Vagabond. It's true. <laughs> That's because it's the worm part. It just becomes white noisy. I can't tell where I am in the song ever because all I'm hearing is something about truck stops or highway vagabonds or getting one off while the other got on. It just was like tumbling around in my brain, got stuck there, couldn't get it out. No. And then I would just, the occasional, okay. It's in the apple. It's too deep in the apple. Yeah. It was a deep apple on this one. I get that. No, I get that totally. And you're right. I feel like a lot of popular country music, I mean, did hit a bro country skid somewhere around that time, if not a little sooner even. I, it probably was a little sooner, but it just took me a little while to become disillusioned with it. Yeah. There's something about this song. I think what they're doing is having her sing the melody twice and layering it so that it sounds like she's singing the same notes, but it's definitely two distinct tracks of her voice. Uh-huh. It feels a little different on this song, and I don't know if I love it, but I don't mind it a ton. I just notice it, and I don't know, sometimes noticing it isn't always the best thing, but I like it. And, oh, in verse two, we get a shout-out to the infamous drifter Willie Nelson. I mean, we talked all about his lifestyle on the road, how he hitchhiked all up and down the West Coast and got around, did some odd jobs. Gotta love it. Or, apparently, We'll find out later if you had to love it, in spite of your wishes. You'll find out. Are you going to tell us what you thought of Ugly Lights? Uh, yeah, I can tell you. Oh, okay, this one gets a pass. I, I wrote a note that says, any light I'm under is an ugly light. Oh, Brownie no. Face. <laughs> That's so sad. That's not what it means. It's the first thing I wrote down before even hitting play on the song. <laughs> Ouch. Well, yeah, the premise of the song is that she's just hanging out in a bar, tearing it up all night until the ugly lights come on. Until the bar closes, they flip on all the bright lights and expose all these rougher sides to the party you couldn't exactly see when the lights were low. Yeah. I think it's a memorable song for me. Really? I don't think it's the album's strongest by any stretch of the imagination, but I think it leaves an impression just because of its use of the phrase ugly lights. It's not a phrase that's unique to the song, and maybe it's very well known known it just wasn't known to me i honestly think this maybe is the first time i had heard it in any sort of context same yeah well it's a phrase that's been around for decades so, so much so because i didn't do any research into it like it sounds like you did i just assumed it was a phrase she coined for the song yeah no i i've never really closed down a bar so i didn't know but yeah i would say our experience walking in and out of all the bars in nashville was my biggest bar experience wow yeah I don't really go to bars because if I'm going to drink, I'm going to drink cheaply with myself and my friends. With and myself? I'll not, not pay exorbitant amounts for bad alcohol. Sounds like a good idea. And if the ugly lights follow you anyway, I mean, there's really no benefit. I think there's a lot of cool lines in this one, too. And, man, it's just a consequence of songwriting. We talked on Eric Church, too, how you can pick out so many little gems. And the question, I guess, is whether they come together into something greater than the sum of their parts. Because not every line is a gem. But some of them, like when the Romeos and Juliets have bummed all my cigarettes and the last kiss in the parking lot's done. You know, like, that's a great little line. That's a great little nugget. Yeah, 
But, you know, if it's not supported by anything, what's that nugget worth? I don't know. But I like the concept. I really like the concept of ugly lights coming up, showing the blemishes on everybody's supposedly picture-perfect life when the lights are down. The pretty lights are on. Or off, maybe? I don't know. Do you have to have pretty lights on, or just turning the ugly lights off is enough, do you think? Uh, for me? Well, uh, for anything. I, I think the less light, the better. Oh, okay. I live in the darkness. <laughs> But there's a reason the mixer computer and I get along so well. Uh, <laughs> you know how some people have like the light dimmer switches where you can like adjust the brightness? Yeah. Yeah, we have a darkness dimmer switch that adjusts the darkness. Anywhere from like underground cave pitch blackness to blackout curtain darkness. Yeah, so that sounds like a miscalibrated normal dimmer switch. Oh, uh, no, it's not miscalibrated. The mixtaper spent, like, an entire weekend on it. Sure. He's an electrician. I don't know if you knew that. Right. I think the first song we're going to skip is You Wouldn't Know Me. I wouldn't know it. We skipped it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit of a ditty. It's got a shorter chorus than the other ones you talked about. Sounds like you're talking about it. I'm just glossing over here. I, I, this is a little substance, but... Listen, you wouldn't know me, but I think we should be friends. We should be friends. One of the album's singles, Greatest Hits. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> and it's the one that she wrote entirely by herself. This was her solo right. And I think it's really clever. She outlines all these characteristics that might be true of the listener. If you do this or if you do that, if you do... X, Y, Z. And we think that it's going to be some kind of commentary on the person, on you, because you do those things. But what she says, like she points that finger right back at herself and says, we should be friends because that's exactly the way I am. So we get along. Do any of these things apply to you? You know, if your mind's as cluttered as your kitchen sink, if your heart's as empty as your diesel tank, if you paint your nails while you cut your loss, if you use alcohol as a sedative and bless your heart as a negative, like, could you be friends with Miranda Lambert? No. No? <laughs> well, uh, losing sleep and gaining weight, that one fits. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you are dunking on yourself today. I thrive in the darkness. Are you willing to fight over men and mamas and Miller Lights? I will fight over mamas. No, Ain't nobody touching my mama. See? Then you could be friends with Miranda Lambert. Uh, just on a couple of things. We, we can probably be acquaintances. We can be acquaintances. That's a lame <laughs> song. <laughs> well, this song, I noticed, does that thing that you really like. Uh-huh. I'm trying to trying to up it for you a little bit. Up it for me. Give me the hard sell. The chorus alters itself. It changes. Sure does. She says in the first one, I can judge the cover because I read the book. But then eventually we get to this point where she could judge the cover because she wrote the book. Yeah. I like it. I think that is a boost to this song. Yeah, I'll give it one boost. One boost. Yeah. Great. There's only a couple things in this song that would allow Miranda Lambert and I to be friends. But one thing that will definitely make us friends, our love of pink sunglasses. You both love pink sunglasses, really? Oh, yeah. Nice. Only pair of sunglasses I own are pink. I don't know if you're serious. I'm 100% serious. Wow. Okay. Mainly because all my normal ones I always break. Oh, I do know <laughs> that. Yes. I watched a pair of sunglasses break off your face once <laughs> with no provocation. Like they just crumbled. They just shattered. On your nose. And I don't know, uh -huh. I don't know how it happened. I was too much for them. Cracked under the pressure of having to be on my face. Yeah, they couldn't handle it. The ugly lights got a little too bright. <laughs> yeah, got a little too bright. They realized whose face they were on. They're like, oh, dang. Snap. But no, I have one pair of uh, breast cancer awareness, like plastic sunglasses that I never wear. And so therefore I've never broken. Oh. So they're the only sunglasses I currently own and they're pink. Well, there you go. You could be friends. Pink Sunglasses is definitely a song that wormed its way into my head, Apple. Um, this is one I don't want to like, but I kind of do. Really? I kind of do. Pink Sunglasses. It's another anthem -y song. It's, it's a little bit between anthem -y and sing song -y. Little, It's like a little anthemic ditty. I always was a little confused by it when I heard it in context, like the first couple times as that I listened to the album, because I wasn't latching on to the main metaphor of it. Because, so, in my head... I never pictured the lenses as pink. In my mind's eye, listening to the song, it's always just like these cheap pink plastic frames and like normal dark lenses. So it doesn't make any sense at all. But really, <laughs> the way you're supposed to think about it is a twist on the traditional rose-colored glasses metaphor. Yeah. Where the lenses are pink, and so you see the world in a different light, you become more optimistic, your problems aren't problematic, and you can simply scoff at them as you walk by. Yeah. Now, in that context, that paradigm, I like the song better, but just to think of why she really loves these, like, cheap, normal sunglasses with pink frames was really not clicking for me. I like the song. I do, too. 
I know I just kind of said I didn't, but all together, complete package, it works, and that's what's important. And in the context of the album, it's a little bit of a carefree song, where some of these songs like, I don't know, Ugly Lights and Running Just In Case are a little bit deep and introspective and really, like, weighty. Pink Sunglasses, along with I Guess We Should Be Friends, are kind of just resigned to life being the way that it is, and you're just gonna roll with it. Go with the flow. It's a lot more carefree and dismissive, which is refreshing. I agree. Heck yeah. Up next is Getaway Driver. Getaway Driver is one that... We're skipping it. Oh, uh, yeah. Getaway Driver is one that never sticks with me much. I, I regularly kind of pass it by or forget about it. It's short, too. Mm -hmm. I guess not in time, but in lyrical content. I was to say, it's three minutes and 53 seconds. It's actually yeah, a longer song. It is, but lyrically it's short. The verses are minuscule in the chorus. Eh, okay. Like well, I said, we're not talking about it, so... N no. The real one I want to talk about is Vice. I would say Vice is probably the second biggest song on this album. One of the biggest singles for sure and actually the first one she released which makes it the very first song people heard from her after her divorce. This was one I knew before uh, listening. Uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. What do you think? I think. I thought. I thunk. Okay. Think, thought, thunk. I do. I like this one, actually. It's a good one. You know me. I'm the ballad guy. It's true. And this is, yeah, ballad, ballad-ish. Pretty darn ballady. Yeah, it's about the vices and the coping mechanisms you pick up and kind of lean on in the wake of tragedy. One thing that struck me about it is its similarity at the beginning to Eric Church's record year. With this vinyl record and a jukebox, it's kind of the same premise where she's kind of been heartbroken or, or is experiencing some intense emotional moment and decides to turn to physical vinyl records to help her get over it and cope with it. I'm a big fan of the chorus of this one. Yeah, I think the strength of the chorus is in its simplicity. Mm -hmm. yep. Melodically, you're, you're in it right away. It doesn't take any time introducing itself. It's just, boom, you're swept up in another vice. And it just fits. It's lethargic, just like, you know, another bed I shouldn't crawl out of at 7 a.m., it just feels like we're stuck in this kind of rut with her. Yeah, it's great in terms of like putting that image in your head of somebody that's just going through the motions, hooked on these vices, just stuck in a rut sort of thing. Yeah. And the other interesting thing about it is how blunt it is. I mean, a song like Pink Sunglasses is thorough metaphor Pink the entire sunglasses. way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's a metaphor the entire way through. And We Should Be Friends is full of a lot of literary tricks. But this song tells it like it is. I mean, it still uses a lot of like individual metaphors to describe, you know, the state of mind. Yeah, it's true. A few. But she says, I feel like when you listen to this song, there's really nothing to read into. It says what it says. Everybody has a vice. Everybody goes through a time in their life when they run into it a bit more than when they don't. She said when she's writing songs, she said, I can't worry about what somebody might twist it into because it's not like I'm hiding anything. Every record I've ever made has been a reflection of where I am right then in my life, however old I am. And so I think it's really poignant that this was the first song she put out from the record after such a public divorce and, and all that. It's honest. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it's feigned or forced. I agree. I agree too. Sorry, audience. James decided the rest of disc one of this album was not worth uh, talking about. So we're going to jump all the way down to disc two. Yeah, I do feel like there's a bit of a slump. And actually, it's kind of unfortunate because I felt like the end of the first half slumped a little bit. And then most of the beginning of the second half slumped a little bit. Big ol' slump. So there's this pretty significant stretch in the middle that is just, it's like a bell curve, you know? Where the beginning starts strong and then we kind of dip a little bit, but then we come back up for the end. And it's a lot. I would love to talk about Smoking Jacket. And I would love to talk about Use My Heart. And I am okay that we're cutting the other two. But <laughs> but there's some good stuff in there. I just, it is long. All these songs are longer songs, too, on this back half. And it just kind of feels like it drags a little bit for me. Big fan, though, of the start of this, too. Tin Man. Tin Man picks it right back up. I mean, that's the outlier of the rest of the bell curve. Tin Man is so dang good. I mean, doesn't even have a chorus. It's just a bunch of verses. Love that. Yeah, it doesn't need one. But yet has that grounding line of, hey there, Mr. Tin Man, that every single verse starts off with. Oh, it's like you read my notes. Yeah, right? It's great. And it is a reference indeed to the famous Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz, who is out here searching for a heart. Yeah, and she's like, trust me, been there, done that, you don't want it. You don't want a heart. That's right. It's also an homage to her favorite Kenny Chesney song, Tin Man, but to a lesser extent. Oh. Because that's not what it's about. That's just, you know, a nice little tribute. And there's just something so soulful and sincere about her ooze that she does between the verses. Yeah. Ooh. 
We haven't had a good ooh in a while. Haven't we? I don't know. It's been a minute. I know, I know we're a big fan of the owos. We? Well. <laughs> it's, just been, it's just been a while. You're right. It's been a minute. Now it hasn't, though. Now it's been approximately zero tracks. Like, usually an ew is bad. It's like ew, right? But no, this is an ew. This is very similar, but distinctly different. A good ooh. Yeah. What I love about this is the third verse is the twist. I mean, it is only three verses, no chorus, but she still manages to keep the story moving. I mean, is it that big a twist? Yeah, it's a big twist. I Absolutely. Because she says, Tin Man, you don't want a heart. You don't want it. It's fine. You don't want it. And then in the third verse, she actually offers up her broken heart to the Tin Man in exchange for his tough exterior and his armor to protect her in the future. I feel like that's a very natural place for this song to go, not really a twist. Yeah, it's a total twist. No. She keeps telling him he doesn't want a heart, and then she says, take a heart. Yeah, but she's like, you don't want a heart, but I'm telling you, heed my warning, but you know, if if you don't, if you don't want to listen to me, at least you know you can have mine. It's broken, and I'll take your art. Like she's offering up a trade. She's not being like, oh, never mind. You definitely can take this heart and go give it a shot. She's just like, hey, I'm telling you as it is. You don't want it, but if you're not gonna listen to me, at least trade me my broken one for your armor. You know, I yeah, feel like it's just well, a natural place for the song to go. It's not a twist. You're right. You're right. Okay, maybe it's not a twist, but it's a it's a development in the story that's significant. The development. It absolutely is a significant development, just not a twist. Okay, fine. fine. As Twist Master General on this podcast. Are you? Are you? I know I am now self proclaimed. Well, added to the list of titles you've given yourself. People's Champion. Twist Master General. I mean, that's a pretty good one. Come on. It's pretty good. And it doesn't make any sense. Do you deliver twists to people? I mean, yeah. it makes me think of the dance, the twist, you know? Like you're just really good at the twist. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Sounds like you should practice. Twist Master General reporting for duty. Great. I mean, to me, I think the direction of the song seems pretty obvious once you think about the Tin Man as a character and his situation. And I guess that is the case for her, too. She said the song sort of wrote itself. I can see that. You know, it's not a ton of lyrics. No. And they all very specifically relate to this character. And again, a very long song for as little lyrics as there are, but it goes by so fast. It does. It just kind of pulls you in and never lets you go. Not once. Also, did you know they had to recast the Tin Man because he breathed in so much of that tin face paint that he got, like, really sick? The original guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a thing. <laughs> I thought that was cool trivia, but you already knew it. That one's for you, audience. I'm the movie guy. Come on. Okay, but it was a book first. And I know. I guess that piece of trivia wasn't about the book at all. <laughs> I, say, like, I don't know what that has to do with anything. I don't know. I just had to... I wanted to win. You've been striking out lately. You got to win last week when I crushed the mixtaper for us. <laughs> yeah, I felt, it didn't feel quite like a win. <laughs> I brought home the win for us. In fact, I specifically, posthumously, will dedicate that one to you. That one was in your honor. When you die, posthumously? <laughs> oh, that, yeah, that wasn't the right word, was it? <laughs> no. I'll take that as consolation at your funeral, I guess. Put it in the will. In my will, it'll say, and to James, I leave the win on the Spin It Podcast, episode 91, Ray Stevens, against the mixtaper. Crushing double, double classic Ford win. I bequeath this on to you. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. With the only stipulation that you must hang this plaque that I had made using my ashes. Oh, uh, what? That says, the people's champion, Twist Master General. I bequeath this unto you. I just like using the word bequeath, so I'm going to say it a few more times in my will. Bequeath, bequeath, bequeath. The end. That's the will. The end? The end. <laughs> Imagine ending your will with the end. Verbatim what my will will say. Okay. Well, with the exception of Tin Man out of the way, we return to the slump of the bell curve with good old days and things that break. Eh. For the birds. For the birds is up next. <laughs> Miranda Lambert is a bird, as we talked about it at the beginning of this podcast episode. No, she's for the birds. I mean, she'd make a pretty good bird. What is, What are the qualities? She's flying here. She's on her way here. I'm actually surprised she hasn't made it yet. I know. Giving her plenty of time. We must really be stuck in bird traffic. Bird traffic? <laughs> what are the qualities that make a good bird? I don't know. It's one of those things. It's like, you, I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. Oh, yeah. I know what makes a bad bird. They ruffle your feathers. Ha, that was good. Thank you. For the birds is another clever twist of words. The verses list all these things that she's against. Yeah. And then the chorus does a little pivot and tells us all the things she's for. So, I've saved you the trouble and I've enumerated all the things in this song that she says she's against. Ready? Okay. You can determine whether this is a list of things that a good bird would like or a bad bird would like. Okay. Gray sky. 
pies. The bird would hate that. Okay, cake. Listen, there's one thing I know about birds, that they're very picky about their cake. Mm -hmm. Yucky, sucky stuff. Yeah. Rotten tomatoes. Oh, okay. Rotten tomatoes, yeah, bird wouldn't like. But the yucky, yucky stuff, they eat worms. That's pretty uh, yucky, sucky. Maybe that's what you need. Maybe you need a, a bird to come and eat. Eat my earworm? Get it out of my <laughs> head, head apple? The bird needs to come and eat Highway Vagabond. Miranda Lambert, get here and eat my earworm. Get it out of my head. Miranda <laughs> Lambert, get it. <laughs> Eat the earworm out of my head, Apple Miranda Lambert shirt coming to the store soon. <laughs> what are we talking about? She also hates uh, fake people. She's against hate. She's against witchy potions, commotions, confrontation, revealing feelings, tears, and slamming hearts in the ceiling. So that's what she's against. Uh, some of the weird ones are okay cake. Who's against cake in any of its forms? I've had some pretty bad cake. Okay, well. Yeah, but she is for the trees and the bees and the dirt, which are all very bird things. It's true. Bees and trees and dirt and birds and sun, breeze, sleeping dogs, curvy, curly girls. She's for questions, for freedom, for seasons. I mean, what's more freedom than the bald eagle, which is a bird? Touche. <laughs> Definitionally, for the birds is a little idiom, meaning that something is not worth consideration or it's unimportant. You know, it's for the birds like it doesn't matter. But obviously we've pivoted it to become I'm in support of the birds and all these little things in life that otherwise may seem insignificant, but they're really important to me. Up next is Well Rested. And up next after that is Tomboy, another one that I really wish we could have talked about. But instead, we're just going to talk about To Learn Her. That's right. Tomboy was on my short list. And I think it's a catchier, maybe better musically song than To Learn Her. But To Learn Her feels like it's important to this record conceptually and lyrically. To Learn Her feels like her trying to write like a classic country song. Mm-hmm. Three chords in the truth. Feels like something that like Willie Nelson or... It's Dolly Parton all the way through. Do yeah, say Dolly Parton... George Jones. Uh, she, it's got like that George Jones run to it. Like he's known for his like going up the scale run. So like when she goes to learn her and goes like up with it, that's like such a George Jones classic sound. He does that a lot. It is. Well, he's also known for his like weepy, emotional voice. Yeah. And this song is saturated with emotion. This one almost felt a little out of place on a modern country album. Well, she is a keeper of the flame, but we don't know that yet. I like this one. It's another verse, verse, verse song. No chorus is to be found, but whereas Tin Man hooks us at the beginning, like you said with Hey There, Mr. Tin Man, this one hooks us at the end of the verses. To love her is to learn her, but some things you just can't learn. This one gets us at the ends, which I like. I think the concept is pretty straightforward. Like, if you're going to fall in love with her, you're going to just start to learn everything about her. You know, what makes a person laugh, what makes them cry, their, their home, their history, their past. But towards the back half of the song, it kind of takes a bit of a sadder turn. She says the tables always turn. To love her is to learn her, and some things you just can't learn. So essentially, I guess this girl is an enigma to him. He tries to get close to her but what he learns about her is that it's just not going to be possible to love her then is to lose her which is a pretty sad realization for this song to come to mm -hmm. but yes uh like i just mentioned a couple seconds ago <laughs> The next song is Keeper of the Flame, and this is one I feel like should have come later in the album. It's already pretty late. It's pretty late, but I don't, th I don't think it should have been the closer, because I've Got Wheels needs to end the album. I think it should have been next to last, to be honest. It's another one of the record singles. Keeper of the Flame also got quite a bit of traction. Really? Mm-hmm. That shocks me. Really? Why? It only has 5 million plays on Spotify. Oh. The singles from an album have way more than that. That's true. I mean, it barely beat out To Learn Her for plays... It lost out to Use My Heart that we didn't even talk about. That's true. Usually you can tell which ones are the singles because they have way more plays. And that's not the case. <laughs> no, it's not. This one, I think, became a single because of its lyrical weight more than it was meant to be like popular. It's just one they wanted to spread around. It's about being a torchbearer to carry on the traditions of women in country music and what an honor and occasionally a burden it is to bear. And she was very particular about how she wanted it to come across. Really? Yeah, she said, I want people to understand that it's not look at me i'm carrying a torch it's like this has been handed to me mm. i have a huge responsibility from all these women that have come before me that have blazed this trail to make way for me to go live my dream as well and write the songs i want to write and sing and just be an example in life okay well in that scenario i'm gonna go with the opposite of the critique i was gonna okay what, what was your critique uh it was not the chorus i was gonna say she didn't go big enough 
with the chorus. But if her point isn't to be like, look at me, I'm the keeper, but to be more like, look at all these people that came before me, now I'm next in line sort of thing, then yeah. she really needed to back it off a little more. Because that oh. I'm the keeper of the flame that she hits the chorus with really sets it up for like the next line to have the drums come in harder and like get a little more anthemic with it. But then it always, the music stays stripped back, even though she's like singing with this like intensity. The music stays melodic, and I didn't really like that. Okay. Um. So she needed to back off her voice to be more melodic to match the lyrics with what she was going for. Or decide to go anthemic with it and punch up the instrumentals. I see. Well, that makes sense. So so the middle of the road approach was not going to work for you in either case. Correct. Right. But you're right. Anthemic is also a word I use to describe it because it's, it's kind of a song that's meant to transcend modern country music and specifically to invoke old country music, but in the context of the modern landscape, which I think it does a pretty good job of. It makes it a statement and it really asserts itself into this 24 song collection. I also want to just put in one exception to what I just said. Okay, yeah. Like Fireflies in the Rain sang perfectly. I really liked it. Oh, okay. So that line in the chorus, she can leave alone. I, I hate to tell you this, I do think she's going to leave all of it alone. Well, that's her mistake. <laughs> it's one of my favorites on the album, and I guess apparently, according to the Spotify plays, it must get overlooked a, a decent amount. Maybe the right amount. Maybe the right amount of overlookage. I don't know. Hard to say. And a song that we're going to overlook is Bad Boy. Sure are. It's fine. It actually, the beginning of Bad Boy, just to call it back to another episode we did, kind of reminds me of the beginning of Honesty on Hippocampus's Bambi, where they mess up <laughs> the intro at the very beginning and kept it in anyway. But that's all I've got to say about it. Up next is Six Degrees of Separation, which is, once again, so many of these songs are just earworms. You're, I, maybe you were onto something talking about worms so early on, because that's exactly how I feel about most of this album. Whether I want to like it or not, it gets stuck in my head. And I guess I did pick some of the most catchy, earwormy tracks to talk about, but that's because those are the ones that just stand with you. They're just in your head all the time. Six degrees of Kevin Bacon. That's probably how it started out. <laughs> That's what I said in my notes. I was like, the song is about how she left this relationship and moved away to get away from her ex. I said it's like the Kevin Bacon number, unless she's talking about an imaginary scenario where she broke up with Kevin Bacon. <laughs> but the whole concept is that, yeah, you can trace your connections to somebody within six degrees. So like, I know Connor, that's one degree. Connor knows the mixtaper, that's a second degree. You know, the, the mixtaper knows, knows the, the gopher. gopher. <laughs> oh, we both went there. That's my third degree. <laughs> Those are your degrees of separation. The joke is that everybody's six or less away from Kevin Bacon. This time though, Kevin Bacon aside, she's talking about how she always is reminded of her ex in random, unexpected ways. So no matter how physically separated they are, something always keeps them on her mind. That's a pretty relatable thing. It totally is. Very much so. I think it's a relatable thing, but I hesitate to say that it's executed super well here. Because the thing that reminds her of her ex is a quarter that gets a street performer to play their song on accident, you know? Or... Or an apartment that feels familiar. I think the examples that she gives of degrees of separation are a little bit lacking. Although I guess to her credit, they definitely do feel like little things. Like things that shouldn't remind you of your ex. Just to prove how still in the throes of that breakup you are. Well, I think the whole concept of the six degrees thing is like, it's wild how... You can find this sort of interconnectivity with things that you wouldn't expect. And so I think it does work out where, you know, she's like, you know, putting your key in the door shouldn't trigger any memory of your ex. But for some reason it does. That's true. In that specific moment, you put the key in the door and it triggered a memory of maybe sometime when you were carrying in groceries with them. And uh, it's just something about the way it felt triggered this surreal memory that you don't want to be having. No, it's true. You're right. When you put it like that, it sounds even better. I will. I am going to kind of agree with you, though, having ar just argued against your point. Ah, yes. Come to the dark side. <laughs> I know how much you like the darkness. I love the dark. I'm already in the dark side. I'm bringing you. So <laughs> I had the opposite problem with this song that I did with Highway Vagabond. I wanted to like this one. Oh, no. I just couldn't get it in my head. Really? The six degrees of separation was like the only line. Everything else kind of just would always fade from memory. It didn't stick with me. It wasn't a... It was out of your reach geographically. Yeah, it wasn't a bone sticker. 
So it wasn't. Didn't stick to your bones. No. Meanwhile, I'm just sitting around munching on Highway Vagabond apples. Worms in them. (laughs) With worms in them. (laughs) You shouldn't do that. Consult your doctor. I can't. They won't get near me. I have too many and they're afraid of apples. (laughs) You keeping the doctors away? Yeah. What a stupid series of jokes. I mean, we're like, you know what we did with the thimble thing where we just made the greatest joke of all time on accident? Yeah. This is like that, but... But not good. We're kind of all over the place. (laughs) The head apple metaphor started out behind the eight ball. (laughs) But up next is Dear Old Son. And up next for us is the last track. And finally, we're at the end. We sure are. I've got wheels. You do? So does Miranda Lambert. Oh, weird that she doesn't really need them. She's got wings. Well, sometimes these wings get a little heavy. I've Got Wheels is a beautiful closing track. These 24 tracks are definitely a journey, a, a musical and an emotional journey. It really kind of feels like we've just read an hour and a half worth of Miranda Lambert's diary, to be honest. We sure did. And I've Got Wheels is a really nice way to end it. <laughs> We finally get an allusion to the title right in that leading chorus. Sometimes these wings get a little heavy. When I can't fly, I start to fall, but I've got wheels and I'm rolling on. So, you know, this isn't the life I envisioned or that I would choose, but these were the cards that I'm dealt and I'm going to soldier through it anyway. I like it. And it kind of takes me all the way back to the beginning of the album with running just in case Highway Vagabond about having wheels and getting on the road again. Just got to keep moving, you know, got to keep going. It's another little bit of determination, this little tiny note of what's next that does a great job at not dead-ending this album with another breakup song or oversaturating it with another love song. It's really plain, simple, and it just kind of shows us that there's more to come for her even after we finish our time listening to this record. It's very not finite. Yeah, but you know what is finite? What's that? This podcast episode, because unfortunately it's time for Final Spin. Yes, it is time for Final Spin. Let's get into it. As for my scores, I do think there's a lot to like about this album. Musically, melodies, man. Chord progressions and everything else aside, the melodies on so many of these songs are so memorable. And so generally, like I said at the very beginning, they mesh well with the lyrics. It's a very consistent kind of album, musically. And for an album this long, that's kind of a hard thing to do without feeling like too much. And I don't think this does. I know you maybe sat through a long hour and a half of it, but I've never felt burdened by this album. And you felt burdened last week? Yeah, no, I did feel quite burdened by Ray Stevens. (laughs) Good. Yeah, I know. It's the year of vengeance. I don't know what you'd expect. Anyway, I'm giving music a 90. Lyrics are an interesting category because I think most of the songs are pretty good all the way through. Some of the songs that we didn't talk about are instances where there's just a couple gems to pick out of the lyrics and the rest maybe don't necessarily pull the same weight or tie it together as well. But I think in most cases on the album, again, 24 tracks, a lot of words, I think they're generally pretty strong, especially for this era of country music. I'm giving them an 87, which is maybe a tad aggressive for me. But I think there's too many instances of cool wordplay or really incisive lyrics. I don't know. I'm giving it that. Instruments and production. I don't think there's much variation to this album, which is good for consistency's sake, but I think it maybe can get a little boring on the instrument side. We don't ever really add many new ingredients to the mix. You know what I mean? You could play through this entire album with the same three or four piece band, you know? Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I'm giving instruments of production an 80. And the overall vibe, it's long, but it's good. It's very personal, and I like it, but I don't like it any more than an 83 for the vibe score, whatever that means. So that's an 83 for the vibe. And overall, most Mostly spurred along by the music and the lyrics. That's an 87.7 from me. All right. Which is number 159 on the rankings list. And actually puts it closest, if you can believe it, to Kanye West in My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy from the other episodes we've done. Interesting. Yeah. She's in between that and Apocalypse Whenever by Bad Sons. Another album with a rose-colored glasses song in Baby Blue Shades. For me, my top three in album order, Conorable Mention. The pink sunglasses. Wow, you really could be friends. Which means, if you're following, if you're paying attention, I did not have to like I Way Back Upon. <laughs> you didn't have to like it in your top three. I mean, for a while there, it was written into my top three as unfortunately. <laughs> okay. 
up next one we didn't talk about but you forced yeah. me to listen to so i feel i'm allowed to put it in my top three you sure are getaway driver really yeah i actually quite liked getaway driver it was not forgettable as you said interesting and then my other two probably no surprise vice and my pick for the playlist Ten man oh and you've got a playlist pick right away too oh yeah i wanted to take it before you could and force me to somehow pick something else <laughs> i don't think i could force you to pick something else <laughs> tin man is a great one i think that's gonna put me in a position where i'm either taking i've got wheels vice or keeper of the flame i think the correct answer there is vice but you do what you want no i think you're right i gotta lock in vice another vice all right no surprises i mean we didn't pick songs right next to one another on the album but we did pick songs right next to one another on what we talked about <laughs> So <laughs> that's technically, yeah, we can't get away from that. Yeah. As for my overall thoughts and opinions on the album, bigger fan of Miranda Lambert's older work, like significantly. So like Tin Man and Vice are the only things on this album that it all compared to some of those Miranda Lambert songs we talked about at the top of the episode when you were asking me what my favorites were. Wow. And even then, I think those other ones still win out on most everything. But Tin Man could maybe sneak its way in above some of them, but... I thought you'd be a bigger fan. I was hoping to be a bigger fan. It wasn't. Yeah, well, that sounds like an unpleasant surprise for you then. Yeah. I wish I could have told it to her to her face, but she's gotten lost somewhere on the bird highway. She didn't ever get here in time. And so I guess I'm just going to have to give a score without her knowing. And that is a score of... Drum roll. Five out of ten. Five out of ten. I was going to put this at a six for you. So... Almost. I was getting close. You don't give fives often. You're pretty stingy with a five. Yeah. You bring some pretty good stuff, usually. I try. You did give A Tribe Called Quest uh, 5 most recently. But before that, it was like episode 42. <laughs> yeah. And this one's going right below. Ooh, wee, ooh, ooh, you look just like Buddy Holly. Okay, so you're putting Miranda Lambert below Weezer. Yeah. Which I think it's a good thing she's not here. That might be a little insulting <laughs> to her. Just this album, not Miranda Lambert herself. No, just this particular record. Yeah. Interesting. Is there anything in particular that kept it from a six? I was playing with the bottom of the sixes, and then I looked over and saw Gabrielle Applin and Anthony Green at the top of the fives, and then was like, no. I like those better. And then I looked at Weezer and went, I think I liked Weezer better too. And so that's where it ended up. Fair enough. What could this album have done differently to score better? Uh, had better songs. <laughs> In a different album. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, there could have been more talk about, you know, Shriner conventions and stuff like that. That would have really helped it out. Whatever. Not enough Shriner <laughs> conventions to, to be your 10. You cut your score from last week in half this week. I just want to say. Yeah, sure did. I didn't cut it in half. You did. You're the one that picked those. <laughs> it's your score. Yeah, well, uh, I listen. I just call it as it is. You're the one that selects what comes. If you wanted me to not cut my score in half, should have brought something that wasn't half of what last week's was. I'll be honest. I think I'm the other way around. <laughs> I think I double <laughs> last week's to get to this, if not more. Good. But most importantly, the unit. We're talking about comparing scores. We don't even know how these are really compared yet. Yeah. This is getting five earwormy head apples out of ten. I'll be honest, there's probably a lot more than five earwormy head apples on this album. Probably. <laughs> if you want to call them that. And, you know, for each one, there's a doctor cowering in their home, fearing the day they come across me and my head apples in the darkness. I don't know what you're saying. Moving on. We already made our playlist picks. That's rare. This was a little off the rails, this episode. Uh, yeah, off the rails, like... Pain and shame and crazy trains. Yeah, those are reasons you should be friends with Miranda Lambert. She'll be here any minute. Any minute. Any minute. Stick around. Anyway, I, I need to end the episode before you keep talking and saying more things. So, if you want to hear us say more things, which I guess is totally counterintuitive to what I'm doing now, you can find us on the internet. Ooh. All over the internet. But especially on Twitter at Spin It Pod, on Instagram at Spin It Pod Official, on the web at www.spinitpod.com and more. Tell a friend about Spin It, you know, so they can wonder what the heck this is too. Do all the internet things. Rate us, follow us, like us, star us. I hope you already like us. Do the things. Do the things. We'll see you next week as the findies continue. And until then, stay hungry and keep, keep spinning. spinning. And now I have to go update my will. Now you have to go update your will. You mean it wasn't already in there before? Oh, uh, I made a promise on what it would what it would say. An oath. Yeah, you can't go back on that. I mean, I could drop dead at any minute. 
trip and fall in my dark home. Your head apple will smash wide open. It'll become head apple sauce. 